পালি গেলে হবে না মদের দা ঠিক <laughs> 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 ঠিক <laughs> 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 আচ্ছা উন্মেষ আছে ইউটিউবে আচ্ছা ঠিক আছে ওই বাত নেই কজন জয়েন করেছে এখন কজন কজন
স্পিকার স্পিকারের এখন সকাল মনে হয় তাই তো হুম হুম স্পিকারের এখন এখন সকাল ঘুম থেকে উঠে চা খাচ্ছে হ্যাঁ 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 শুনে যাচ্ছে হুম ঘুমের শুনে যাচ্ছে YouTube का जाना चाहिए उनमें? किसी भी क्यों नहीं है सुनो क्यों नहीं है कौन? बैंक का वैसे आप जो इस बैंक
स्पीकर आसे नी Thank <laughs> 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 प्रत्येके बोले दें हेलो हेलो उत्तम सुना जा हेलो हेलो हाँ सुनते तु आ सुनते हाँ 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 भिडियो हाँ हाँ ठीक है
ঠিক আছে না আমি না আমি তো ফুল স্ক্রিন করে না আমি স্লাইড চেঞ্জ করতে পারবো না छा बेजे गे शुरू करब कॉलेज Dr. Manna is working as an assistant professor in physics at Illinois State University, USA, since 2016. He completed his PhD degree from Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. He did his MSc in electronics from Jadavpur University. I am glad to mention that he is my classmate during both the graduation and master's. master degree before joining at illinois state university he worked as an he worked as a postdoctoral research scientist at james frank institute institute university of chicago and department of physics and applied mathematics at columbia university dr manna has published more than 30 research papers in international journals thank you dr manna for giving us your uh, precious time out of your busy schedule now i would like to request our vice principal sir to formally welcome the speaker and inaugurate the session over to you sir thank you good evening everyone respected precious person and our dignitaries dear colleague precious scholars organizing committee convenors joint convenors iqc coordinators and affection student it is really a great pleasure and privilege to present in the international webinar organized by the department of electronics and physics in collaboration with iqc being the head of the institute i must congratulate the teachers of the department of electronics and physics especially dr chavan kumar panda has he has taken initiative to organize the international webinar first of all i on behalf of the institute must welcome dr uttam manna assistant professor department of physics linear state university usa i would be immensely grateful as he has responded to our invitation despite his busy schedule i do hope that our participation would reap a sound harvest from the this discussion i i firmly believe that the this discussion will be interesting and interactive one the survey of the days each and reciprocal discussion i do hope would further illumine the minds of the teachers and taught i wish a warm success of the international webinar once again thanking you all namaskar
Thank you, sir, for the welcome at this. Now, now I would like to request Dr. Manna to start the talk. Before that, there is a small announcement uh, for the audiences. Audiences are requested to mute you, yourself and off your camera. And also, you are requested not to hit the present now button during the talk. Uh, at the end of the talk, there will be a di discussion session. If you have any queries or questions, you can directly ask the speaker and or you can also put your queries in the chat box uh, in both the YouTube and Google Meet link. Uh, uh, and also at the end of the talk, a feedback link will be provided to you. You need to fill up the uh, feedback link and send it to us. And based uh, upon receiving your feedback form, we'll issue the e-certificate uh, through your Email. So, hope you will uh, cooperate with us and together we will enjoy the talk. Thank you. Now, uh, Dr. Manna, please start. Okay, great. So, th uh, thank you very much, Sovan and uh, Vice Principal Sir, for inviting me. And I know the timing is kind of a little bit odd. So, it's here like 7 30 in the morning on Sunday, so which is kind of challenging, you know. To get up. <laughs> uh, anyway, so so as, as did Sovon mentioned, you know, like uh, so we were the first batch of electronics uh, in Pascula, like in 2000, I think 98, sorry, 98, yeah, 98. And I think uh, like uh, not only Sovon and myself, and actually most of our friends have gone on to like do reasonably well, like uh, after we finished our PhDs and all. So I hope, uh, you know, uh, like that um, in this talk, I mean, you know, like uh, like the work that I do, it's like uh, uh, at, uh, I mean, I, I hope I'll be able to kind of uh, break it down to like uh, from, from really basic level so that uh, you can take something home, you know. And, and I think the format is kind of a formal uh, format that you ask your question at the end of it. But, you know, sometimes uh, if you don't understand something uh, in, the, in, the bit, in between the talk, it's better to kind of clarify those. So if you want to ask something in between, please feel free to stop me and ask question, you know. And so, uh, so I'm going to talk about dielectric nanophotonics as an alternative to nanoplasmonics, you know. Now, I mean, I, I teach like very large classes, you know, uh, like sometimes like I can have like 170 students in my class. And I always like to kind of start with giving some perspective, you know, like why we are doing certain things, you know, even like in a physics class. So in that spirit, so let me ask you some of if you, if you mind kindly answering. I mean, if you cannot, that's okay. So the question is like, what comes to your mind, you know, when you think about light? I mean, I mean, light means like, uh, I'm basically talking about these lights, you know, like when you think about light, I think the first thing comes to our mind is the sun, right? So sun is like a huge source of energy and it gives us light. And at our homes, <laughs> We all use electric bulbs, right? And also, like probably, like if you ask this to every physicist, probably laser would be like within top three or top five. Like the invention of laser actually change the uh, change the world, you know. So laser is also one of them. Now, this is the the picture in the left. You see, is the first laser which was invented by Ted Maiman in 1960, you know. And if you look at the scale bar at the bottom, you see this one centimeter. I mean, this whole thing is like few tens of centimeter, like maybe 20 centimeter or something. I don't know, maybe 10 centimeter. So the whole laser, uh, which kind of cavity, which um, uh, does the lasing, you know, is, a, is like few centimeters. But on the other hand, the pictures in the right side you see is is today's lasers. These are like these are called nano lasers. And if you look at the scale bar, you know these are they are on the order of nanometer. 
And if you go by dimension, you know, the, the dimension of leisure has shrunk by like 10 to the power seven times in, in about uh, uh, 60 years, you know. So every decade, the dimension of le leisure on average uh, had shrunk by like one order, order of magnitude, you know. So this has been all possible because of advent of nanoplasmonics. So I don't know if you are uh, familiar with the term. Uh, so, the, uh, so the advent of nanoplasmonics, and so I'm going to dis uh, talk about nanoplasmonics uh, in a minute. So what is nanoplasmonics? And also, I don't know if you follow popular science and all, uh, you know, like Harry Potter and all those kind of stuff. So in Harry Potter, you know, they use this uh, clock called uh, invisibility clocking and like perfect lensing, like, you know, you can lens, uh, you can focus light to like a, like like a very very tiny spot beyond the diffraction limit so all these various possibilities has been proposed and these are these are all because of advent of nanoplasmonics so in the last like 10 20 years i mean all the like top uh, institutions and universities in the world have actually invested a lot of time effort you know money uh, in a, in in actually understanding and nanoplasmonics, the, the basic physics behind it, and as well as uh, uh, like potential applications, you know. So, so, so these are some of the perspective that one can uh, think of uh, when thinking about nanoplasmonics. So, this is going to be the outline of my presentation. So, I'll start with what is nanoplasmonics? Uh, nanoplasmonics in a nutshell, and then. I'll tell you the, the, the problems, the existing problems with nanoplasmonics, uh, which is loss. You know, nanoplasmonics are made of metal nanoparticles. And, and I'll just tell you why non nanoplasmonics always mean loss. And then I will describe, can we use high index dielectric nanostructures, you know, as an alternative to nanoplasmonics? Some slides are not changing. Not changing? Yeah, now it's changing. Yeah, I think I think the, in the full screen the slides are not changing for some reason. I don't know. Okay, so so I, so now is it is it going to the next like topic within the slide? Yeah, yeah. Now it's okay. Gone. Okay, so I, while changing the slide, I'll I'll skip the full screen and then use the animation. Okay. Okay, so, so then like in part three, okay, so let me start this slide again. So in part, uh, so this is the outline of the presentation. So the, I'll start with uh, nanoplasmonics in a nutshell, that is what is nanoplasmonics. And then I'll describe why nanoplasmonics always mean loss. So nanoplasmonic structures are made of metal nanostructures and metals are always lost, you know. So I'll describe why is that. And then we'll, I'll investigate, you know, can, can we use high refractive index dielectric nanostructure as an alternative to nanoplasmonics, you know? So, and then I'll describe some of the results uh, in, in, uh, that we have got in, in recently in our lab, uh, some of the experiments that we did. And then finally, I, I believe that uh, you know, like Vithan Chandra College is like, uh, uh, like majorly undergraduate uh, uh, only uh, school and so we also have like a lot of undergraduate and a lot of undergraduate students participate uh, in my research so i'll describe uh, what some of the undergrad students do in my lab and 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 so yeah so now before i actually start i i just wanted to like describe some very basic things you know that is uh, that everybody should uh, be aware of before actually i can start talking about my work that is all the light sources that I talked about, like the sun or the light, or electric bulb or the laser. You know, these are all electromagnetic waves. Now, what is an electromagnetic waves? I think some background background is coming, so I don't know. Yeah, so. Yeah, so, so all these light sources that I talked about, 
are, are examples of electromagnetic waves, you know, the light from sunlight or the light from electric bulbs or light from laser, right? So they're all electromagnetic waves. And, and as you know that in an electromagnetic wave, you have this electric field and the magnetic field, and they are perpendicular to each other, and they are propagating in a direction perpendicular to both the electric and magnetic fields, you know? In other words, you have the electric field, magnetic field, and the direction of the propagation are perpendicular to each other, or they're mutually perpendicular to each other, right? And so that's what it looks like, you know? And the difference between the two maxima or the two minima you know, you know, of this electromagnetic wave is called the wavelength, right? Now, if you send a visible light through a prism, right, it breaks into these seven colors right, that we studied in our uh, high school, like our Vivgeo, right? The violet, indigo, blue, green, you know, yellow, orange, red. And if you look at their wavelength, the visible light, they span from 380 nanometer to 780 nanometer. So, so, so these these different values of the wavelength actually is, are responsible for different colors of light. You know? And so this is, uh, uh, so this is basically like the very like basic uh, knowledge of light that we need to know. Now, when I did mention about the wavelength of visible light there in the nanometer scale, now, now if you are not familiar with like what is a nanotechnology or nanometer scale, so basically, you know, uh, nanometer is 10 to the negative ninth of a meter. And if we compare some of the things that we know in our daily lives, are like for example, hair. You know, hair has a diameter of like one, 100 micron, you know, and, and like say, you know, like if you are, if you're writing a full stop within, within your pen, you know, that is like one millimeter. And so now you can think about a, 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 a nano dimension is like say 10 to the negative ninth of a meter. So it's like really, really small, right? Now in this talk, you know, I will, I will describe the interactions of this visible light that, that, I don't know, can you see this slide or this slide visible to uh, someone, to all, all of you? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Visible. Visible, okay. So, so if you if you draw like a, uh, like a draw a full stop with a pen, right? So that is like you know, one millimeter, and then you can think about like how small a nanometer would be. And in this talk, I'll talk about the interactions of the visible light. You know, the light uh, having a wavelength between three hundred eighty to seven hundred eighty nanometer with 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 matter or with with nano, nanosphere whose whose size is going to be smaller than the wavelength of, of, of light in the visible frequencies. You know, that's what uh, I wanted to make that clear first, okay? So our structures are going to be like, say, like a couple of hundred nanometer in dimension, and we will study the interaction of the visible light, you know, from 380 to 780 nanometer with, uh, with nanospheres of dimension say 100 to 200 nanometer. Okay, so now, so, so that's the basic information that we, we need to move forward uh, with understanding what actually we are doing. So now, as did I mention that people invest a lot of time understanding nanoplasmonics. So what is nanoplasmonics? Now, if you want to confine an electromagnetic wave, you know, conventionally, the way you can do it is that you can have a two plane mirror, you know, and then you can have an electromagnetic wave confined within the plane mirror. You know, this is the principle of an optical cavity. Okay, and if you have an electromagnetic wave confined within the mirror, then the electromagnetic wave can go back and forth. And, uh, from, and they reflect each other. And then they, there will be an interference between the uh, two reflected uh, rays. And because of that, you will have a standing wave you know, within the cavity. So this is the basic principle of an optical cavity. This is also known as the fabry parrot cavity, you know. And the length of this cavity is integral multiple of the half wavelength. 
in other words so if you have a light of 500 nanometer then this cavity is going to be for this electromagnetic standing wave to exist within the cavity the length of the cavity has to be 250 nanometer you know so this is the basic principle of a cavity now inside the cavity when you have the standing wave electromagnetic wave so it will have both the electric fields and the magnetic field components and they are actually would be 90 degree out of edge okay within the cavity now the next next question is so before i go to the next question so now it turns out that if you want to confine light within the cavity okay as did i mention for a visible light say at 500 nanometer the smallest length then you can confine an electromagnetic wave to is going to be lambda over 2 like the wavelength over 2 and if you are 500 nanometer that means that the smallest wavelength you can confine ele ele your electromagnetic wave to is like 250 nanometer. So you could not possibly confine ele your electromagnetic wave beyond that length scale. And so this is what is known as the diffraction limit of light. Okay. And so if you if you took a light of like say 1000 nanometer wavelength, then the smallest length you could uh, you could confine the light is say to uh, 500 nanometer you know so this is mm, the fundamental limit that that there is that, uh, yeah the slides are not visible i think uh, oh. for, uh, okay so can you present again some participants are taking so is it visible now the slide is visible to me from the beginning but uh, you can see two student has told but some not participants have yeah i think they are probably watching in the phone can and they yeah, yeah, yeah. the slide from okay so so should i start start this slide from the beginning or should should i move on you can move on okay uh, can you present again Means you can okay, do so just, just quit and you can uh, stop the present presentation and again. Oh, like uh, start the presentation again? Yes, yes. Okay. Right. Oopsie, wait, wait. <laughs> Hello, uh, Sandeepana Sarkar, can you mute yourself? Okay, so can you see now? Yes, no, it's, it's visible, okay. visible. Okay. Okay, so so yeah, so so I, I was describing that you know, so so if you want to confine electromagnetic wave, so and the diffraction limit tells us that you know you can only uh, the length of the cavity has to be like the, the, the standing wave to exist within the cavity, the length of the cavity has to be half the wavelength of the light. You know, this is called the diffraction limit. Now, if you want to confine beyond the diffraction limit, like below the diffraction limit, then you need to, you need to abandon two assumptions. You know, one is that the base confinement is provided by mirrors, pair of mirrors. And number two is that the optical energy that is confined within the cavity is solely electromagnetic in nature. Okay, so you need to abandon these two assumptions that, that you can achieve base confinement by providing uh, two meters. Number two is that the optical energy is electromagnetic energy. So I'll talk about that in a minute, okay? Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Okay, so, so can we confine light beyond the diffraction limit, like beyond the uh, 
uh, beyond it is possible in an optical cavity. Now we all studied, you know, I think we, this, is, this was covered in high school, if I remember, that if you, if you illuminate a, a, a conducting sphere of metal, you know, with light, then the, the electric field of the light, you know, light is electromagnetic wave, it has electric field and magnetic field, and the electric field of the light, it polarizes the, the conducting sphere. So by polarization means that, you know, it, it, uh, it, it kind of moves the positive charge to one side and the negative charge uh, to the other side. So it basically uh, displays the electron cloud within the uh, conducting sphere. And as a result, you can create a polarization state. Now this is a picture when the electric field that you are applying is a static case, you know, the electric field is not changing with time. On the other hand, you know, if you, if you illuminate a metal nanosphere with a electromagnetic wave, which is, uh, whose amplitude is changing over time, then what you can do is you can have this phenomena that you are moving the electron cloud from its original position. As a result, you cre create the polarization in one direction, in one half of the optical cycle. And then for other half of the optical cycle, you can actually Create the, the direction of the polarization can be in the opposite direction. And as a result, you can actually create some kind of an oscillation of the, the electron plasma that, that exists within the conducting sphere. And they have a frequency called plasma frequency, and when the incident illumination actually is in resonance with the plasma frequency of the metal nanoparticles, actually that's, that's why you can, uh, you can have a very large enhancement of the electric field at the surface of these metal nanoparticles. You know? And so this is what, this is what is known as uh, like, uh, like nanoplasmonics or surface plasmon resonance. You know? And if you, if you see, see this case, this calculation here, so the size of this nanosphere is about say, like few tens of nanometers. You know? And so in this case, when you are illuminating a metal nanosphere with, with some external field, and as a result, if you have a localized surface plasma resonance, then the optical fields are confined within the nanoscale structure. You know? So if say your, your uh, size of the um, particle is like say 50 nanometer, then your electromagnetic fields are co confined within, the, within that volume. You know? And so in this way, you can actually confine electromagnetic wave well below the diffraction limit. You know, so this is the physical picture at the heart of nanoplasmonics. You know, so what you do is you take metal structures and you uh, illuminate the metal structure with with some kind of um, uh, light, and as a result, if uh, at surface at plasmon resonance at resonance you can have a very large uh, enhancement of the electric electric field at the surface, and as a result you can and and the size of this the volume of this electromagnetic field distributes scales with the system size, you know. And that is, that is basically the physical picture of all the nanoplasmonics or nanophotonics phenomena that we uh, observe in our daily lives. And so because of this, you know, once you achieve that, then you can do a number of things with that. Like for example, you know, you can, you can put a molecule near to the this, this enhanced electromagnetic field, you know, and th that can amplify the Raman signal from these molecules. And then we call that as uh, surface enhanced Raman scattering, you know, or also like uh, if, if you put like a fluorescence, uh, like a fluoromic, um, fluor, you know, fluoropore or like a, um, uh, like a, you know, some kind of organic molecules, you know, which has, which, which shows photoluminescence or fluorescence, you can actually, uh, change the decay rate of those, and we know that as a, a Purcell effect, you know. So you can change the uh, Purcell effect, and then you can actually also use uh, these metal nanostructures to optically trap uh, like very, very tiny particles, you know, optical trapping. And also, like some people, I think, invested a lot in terms of uh, plasmonic solar cell, where, you know, people uh, used metal nanoparticles in the active layer of a solar cell in the hope that it will increase the absorption and so on, you know. And also there is, um, there is talk about, uh, uh, you know, metal, optical metamaterials, like for example, the, the invisibility clock that I talked about. 
So if you can arrange these metal nanoparticles in a, in a specific way, then it, you can create some artificial magnetic resonance, and that can basically give you uh, some metamaterial phenomena. So all these uh, fascinating possibilities are actually in, in principle possible using nanoplasmonics, and that's what people have been trying to do in last maybe 15, 20 years, you know. Now, if you see all these, uh, all these papers that have cited here in nature photonics or like nature materials or science, so these are like the, some of the, like not some of the best, they are the best journals you can actually publish, you know, I mean they are like the, like the top most journals in, in this field. And, and if you track the amount of publication that has happened in this field, you know, every year, like a significant amount of paper has been published in like around 2015, like people are publishing about 10,000 papers every year, you know. But unfortunately, so far there have been very few practical applications to date, you know. And the reason being that nanoplasmonic structures are made of metals, and the metals are lossy. So what is mean by lossy? So let's let's try to investigate that. So why nanoplasmonics means loss? What is the problem with nanoplasmonic structures? Now again, if you remember, uh, I, th I don't know, in your first year or, or your high school, we did study uh, uh, like the simple harmonic motion of a spring, right? In a spring, if you have a simple harmonic motion, then your total energy is mechanical energy. And as the spring kind of goes back and forth, then your total energy oscillates between your kinetic energy and the potential energy of the system. Now the exact same thing happens for an electromagnetic energy when the, the energy is confined in an optical resonator. But in this case, the total energy it bounces back and forth between the electric energy and the magnetic energy. So instead of pot, uh, uh, potential energy and kinetic energy in, a, in an oscillator, in, in, a, in an optical resonator, the total energy goes back and forth between the electric field energy and the magnetic energy. Okay, so now what happens is that when you make the length of the optical cavity much, much smaller than the wavelength of light, you know, that is when you confine the electromagnetic wave below the diffraction limit, then you have electric energy, but the magnetic energy is too small for you to conserve the total energy. And as a result, the the total energy can radiate outside the cavity and the electromagnetic wave cannot exist within the cavity. So to overcome that, what we can do is we can introduce free electrons in the system like for a metal. Once you have a free electrons like metal in the system, metal nanoparticles, you know, then your total energy can go back and forth between the electric field energy and the kinetic energy of the electrons. So you need some kind of kinetic energy from free carriers such as electrons, you know, to conserve the total energy. So this is possible because of this uh, available, availability of free energy, free energy carriers such as electrons. Now as soon as you, you introduce electrons into the system, then there is a problem. Now we know that the electrons, they're freely moving inside, inside the like metal nanoparticles. And during this time, they actually collide with each other, right? So there is a mean free path associated with it. And there is a collision frequency or relaxation time, right? Which is the inverse of the collision frequency and which is ratio of the mean free path divided by the velocity of the, of the electrons. And if you do this simple math, you'll find out that the relaxation time for these electrons is about 10 femtosecond, means 10 to the one negative 15th of a second. So, so what this means is that even though you have this very large enhancement of the electromagnetic field at the surface because of the surface plasmon resonance, the energy is lost very fast at this rate. Like the energy is lost at the femtosecond rate. Before you can actually collect the energy, the enhancement of the energy and do, do uh, make use of it for any application that you want, the energy is lost, you know, and the energy is dissipated. So you cannot really make use of uh, the nanoplasmonic phenomena 
that uh, that that is supposed to like uh, give you good efficiency of the device so the, the 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 same electrons actually which makes uh, uh, confinement of the electromagnetic wave beyond the diffraction limit possible is responsible for the loss within the structure you know so it's like a double edged sword you know like it, it helps you uh, to do something but it also can kill you you know something like that so and so this is something which is kind of uh, i don't know if you can see it so let me uh, do this one more time so so this is uh, this is like people who are in psychology you know they they are familiar with this so there is a uh, thing called uh, kuba ross grief cycle you know so you know when people like people free, like uh, face grief so they go through various uh, stages like you know they go through denial first then they they make they get angry and then they, they detach themselves and they try to have a dialogue you know finally they accept and then they return to mini, meaningful life so these are like different stages of grief and people who work in nanoplasmonics have gone through these steps you know i used to work that so i used to be one of them anyway so if you see at the bottom there is a thing called uh, detachment and should we go back to dielectrics you know and there is a, in the last five years or so there is a growing interest in in dielectric nanostructures so let me talk about uh, some dielectric nanostructures and if they can provide you some alternative to nanoplasmonics you know okay so that comes brings me to the next part of the presentation which is can we use high index dielectric nanostructures as an alternative to nanoplasmonics so that is the third part of the presentation okay now this i have taken from the internet now if you think about the difference the difference between a metal and a dielectric is this so in metal you have a lot of free electrons but in dielectrics you don't have free electrons on the contrary those electrons are attached to some some uh, every nucleus you know and and when you're trying to polarize a, a, a dielectric so you have this polarization uh, polarization due to just not the electrons but actually you are trying to align the atoms uh, with uh, along the electric field so, you know, so that's the difference between a metal and a dielectric now if you studied uh, electromagnetics electrodynamics yet i don't know if you have done it yet so if you have studied this and this is actually from textbook definition of polarization of dielectric this is straight from griffith's textbook you know and so you can actually describe the potential within a dielectric as as a like a di divergence of the surface charges and the volume charges you know and and once you have that then if you take a gradient of this potential you can actually find out the electric field inside dielectric but anyway so let's don't, don't go into that all those complicated equation the physical picture is something like this the physical picture in plasmonics you have the large, uh, large enhancement of the electromagnetic field at the surface because of the free electrons but on the other hand in dielectric nanostructures you can have a large enhancement of the electric field due to the bound electrons you know that's all the difference and i'm i'm i just want you to remember that okay so there is and so the origin of the electromagnetic enhancement field at the dielectric nanostructures can be due to the oscillation of bound electrons you know so, but in the other hand in metal they are from free electrons so that's the only difference and if you look at the relaxation processes in a dielectric you know and if you have like a dipole relaxation and then you can see that the dipole relaxation frequency is in the in 10 to the power 9 hertz which is basically in the order of nanosecond now this would mean that in, in dielectric the loss rate is 10 like six orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the loss in a metal nanostructures so inherently fundamentally because you have the electrons which are bound to the nucleus so the the rate of loss is six orders of magnitude smaller in a dielectric nanostructure <laughs> So in principle, we have uh, we can use dielectric nanostructures to minimize the losses uh, in, in nanophotonic uh, devices. Uh, another uh, uh, point we should consider is that you know when 
you illuminate a metal nanostructure you know you you and if your size of the metal nanoparticles is much much smaller than the wavelength of light say like few tens of nanometer then we can describe the the scattering of these uh, small particles in terms of Rayleigh scattering you know and and when you have a Rayleigh scattering uh, from a from a structure then the the dominant contribution comes from the dipole contribution the dipole uh, oscillation you know so the dipoles are only contributing to the uh, scattering amplitude and this is a typical optical spectra of a gold nanoparticles and as you can see that for nanometer for diameter from 50 to 100 the scattering uh, cross section uh, lies within the visible frequency like about 550 to 600 nanometer and these peaks are from excitation of the dipoles within these metal nanoparticles but on the other hand for dielectric nanostructures things lit, uh, become a little bit complex a complex in the sense that when you have a displacement current within a nanosphere because of the bound electrons then you have this current which is circulating in space along the nanosphere you know and when you have a circulating current and we know from maxwell faraday's law of induction then a curl of the electric field can give you a time varying magnetic field okay so for a dielectric nanostructure when you are illuminating a dielectric nanosphere with light in addition to the uh, electric dipole resonances because of the circulating nature of this uh, of this excitation in addition to the electric resonances you can also get a magnetic resonances within the structure which is not possible for 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 metals and if you look at the calculation of scattering efficiencies so in for a metal you have a scattering from like electric dipole or or if the size of the particle is bigger you know you can have electric quadrupole and so on but on the other hand, for a, for a dielectric nanostructure, you can have electric dipole and magnetic dipole and so on. And, and this scattering phenomena in a, in a dielectric nanostructure can be described by uh, uh, something called me scattering, you know. And so I'm not going to detail into there, but this cannot be described in the usual Rayleigh scattering, but rather we need to use uh, me scattering to describe this phenomena. Okay, so, so, so just to summarize, so basically what I'm saying is that for a metal nanostructure, when, when you are illuminating a metal nanosphere with light, you, you get only electric resonances. It can be electric dipole or magnetic uh, or electric quadrupole or electric octopole and so on, depending on the size of the particles. But on the other hand, for a dielectric nanosphere, you not only get the electric resonances, you can also get the magnetic resonances. You know, so that is the take home message from this slide. And this is what is called the multiple zoo. Okay, so these are the various multiples that actually you can excite within a dielectric nanostructure. You know, the top row says the dipoles, and the dipoles can be electric, magnetic, or toroidal. I'll talk about the toroidal dipole in a minute. And it can be quadruple. The quadruple can be electric, magnetic, as well as toroidal. And the octopoles can also be electric type, magnetic, and toroidal as well. Now, the rightmost column actually shows the radiation pattern of these various types of multiples. Now, if you see that, all the dipoles, like electric, magnetic, and toroidal dipoles, have an identical radiation patterns, you know. And so is uh, for quadruples and octuples. So all the octuples have the identical radiation pattern, no matter uh, if they're electric or magnetic or toroidal in nature. And so, same is the case for octuples. And so this is, uh, I don't know if you can see this slide, but so this is the first experimental report, you know, in 2012. Uh, I think this is, a, uh, this is a group from Russia. So this is the first experimental report of uh, of observation of uh, scattering spectra of dielectric nanostructures uh, at the single nanoparticle level. So what they did was they, they, they created single uh, nanoparticles of dielectric and then they take the samples to a scanning electron microscope and find out the diameter of the particle and then bring the same particle under an optical microscope and measure the dark field scattering spectra. 
Now, as you can see that for diameter 100 nanometer, one get a magnetic dipole at around 500 nanometer. On the other hand, for diameters of 140 nanometer, you get magnetic dipole and the electric dipole. And for 180 nanometer, the, the optical spectra becomes very complex. So you get magnetic dipole, electric dipole, magnetic quadrupole, all these various multiple modes that I talked about is the, the slide before. Actually, you can detect those modes if you measure the resonances, optical spectra of, of a dielectric nanosphere. So this was the first experimental uh, uh, kind of uh, detection. And then following that, you know, people have gone on to like see various uh, phenomena in dielectric nanostructures. For example, people have seen enhancement of electric and magnetic uh, hotspots for a, for a uh, nano, dielectric nanosphere dimer. And also people have seen uh, surface enhanced Raman scattering, you know, in, in dielectric nanostructure. And also, you know, like the dielectric nanospheres or nanostructures uh, like silicon can be used as antenna. And, and here people have measured the directional scattering in an antenna. And also, uh, like there have been a report of uh, a third harmonic generation. These are nonlinear uh, optical phenomena in silicon. So people have actually observed these as well. So, so last like five, seven years, you know, people have uh, start, slowly started uh, doing research on this field. So in principle, you know, in high index dielectric nanostructures can potentially provide an alternative uh, to nanoplasmonics. But we, we will have to wait and see if actually this can lead to some kind of application. Okay, so then that brings me to the fourth part of the presentation. That is, you know, let me, I, I'm going to talk about some of the experiments that we did in our lab and some of the results related to the dielectric nanostructures. So in our lab in the last, uh, last uh, year or so, you know, I have been studying, we have been studying something called an electrodynamic anapole state. You know, now this anapole, this is a Greek term, you know, it, it, it means without poles, means that, you know, it, you, you, can, you, can, you can have an excitation of a state or a mode which does not radiate in the far field, means it, it, there is no, it does not, it's a non-radiating mode. You know, if you, you, can, you can excite those modes, but it does not radiate in the far field, you know, that's what it means by poles, no poles. If it doesn't have a pole, it does not radiate. Now this term anapole was actually used by Yakov Yeldovich in 1957, you know, to describe the anapole moment in nucleus. You know, he actually found out theoretically that, you know, for a spin up Dirac particle like nucleus, you know, to have, an, have a, uh, like a stable configuration, there has to be an anapole moment within the nucleus. And and this was experimentally detected in 97 by Carl Weiman at the University of Colorado Boulder. And actually for, for this, actually he got a Nobel Prize in I think 2001 or something, you know. And so this was so important. And, but this is a static anapole and which does happens at I think radio or microwave frequencies. But we are talking about non-radiating anapole modes in dielectric nanostructures, which is electrodynamic in nature because it uh, is a dynamic mode. And and, and it is in the visible frequencies, like the optical frequencies, you know, that, that I, I did show you the spectrum of. And the non-radiating anapole mode was detected and reported in a dielectric nanospheres of silicon in 2015 first, you know. And this, this paper came in Nature Communications. Now let me briefly describe what an anapole is. Now, if you remember the toroid, I think we did study toroid in, again in a high school or, or somewhere first year, right? If you have a solenoid, and then if you carve the two ends of a solenoid, then you get a toroid, right? And, and it, because of this poloidal current flowing at the surface, you get a magnetic field within the structure, right? Sorry, because of the poloid current, you get a toro toroidal dipole, and that can produce a magnetic uh, re resonance within the structure, you know? Now you can have this exact this phenomena instead of a solenoid. You can have exact this phenomena within an, in a single dielectric nanosphere. You know, one dielectric nanosphere. In a one dielectric nanosphere, you can have these electric multiples like positive and negative charges. You know, and 
So you can have this uh, electric resonances. And then you can also have this toroid, toroidal multiples where you have this poloidal current flowing at the surface of this single nanosphere, or single dielectric nanosphere. And because of that, you can actually get a toroidal response. And as did I mention before, the electric and the toroidal multiple, they have a exactly same or identical uh, radiation pattern. Now imagine a situation where the magnitude of the electric dipole moment and the toroidal dipole moment are say equal to each other and they are 180 degree out of phase within a dielectric nanosphere. So, so we, are, we are illuminating a dielectric nanosphere with light and because of that you have these electric dipoles, you know, I mean, and because of the high refractive index of the structure, you can have a toroidal dipole flowing at the surface of this dielectric nanosphere. And if you have the magnitude of the electric and the toroidal dipole equal to each other, and if they're 180 degree out of phase, then what can, you can have is you can actually cancel out the scattering in the far field. So then you will have a situation where the structure is excited and the field is is there locally within the volume of the structure, but it does not radiate in the far field. You know? So this is a non-radiating configuration, and that is known as anapole state. Now how to detect such a, uh, such a state? Do, the, do they exist in a dielectric atmosphere? Now that nature communication paper I talked about, you know, they, oh, sorry, before that, you know, uh, so in, in 2012 paper where there was a first detection of anapole mode, I, I showed you that, you know, like for 180 degree nanometer, uh, sorry, 180 nanometer dielectric nanosphere, you have this magnetic dipole, electric dipole, magnetic quadruple, and the optical spectra is very complex, you know. So, so it is very difficult to detect anapole state in dielectric nanospheres. So, so, so if you want to detect anapole modes, you know, using a spherical shape dielectric nanosphere and plane wave, this is not the best way to do it because in addition to the electric modes, you have the adjacent magnetic modes also, also excited within the structure and you will not be able to detect the cancellation of the, of the far field scattering leading to the anapole state in the spherical structures. So to overcome that, what they did was the Nature Communication paper, the first time when they reported, what they did is they designed a special kind of a disk called a nano disk. You know, so they, they made uh, some silicon nano disks using E-beam lithography and with a diameter about 200 nanometer. And these nano disks have only dominant contribution from the electric modes, you know, and the magnetic modes are, are far somewhere else. So within the measurement window, you know, they only have contribution from the electric dipoles. And, and then what they did was they did two measurements. One is that they measured the near field by, by near field scanning electron microscopy. And at the same time, they measured the dark field scattering spectra. And by correlating those two measurements, they found that at some wavelength, here 650 nanometer here, you have a pronounced dip at the optical spectra. You know, and, and they did some calculation and found that at that particular wavelength, you know, the electric dipole and the toroidal dipole have the equal magnitude and they are 180 degrees out of phase. And from this, they concluded that they have uh, excited anapole state within a silicon nano disk. You know, now these nano disks are very difficult to make. You know, they are, they are, they, you have to be very precise in terms of how you make and they, you have to have like expensive lithographies and, and so on. So what we want to do uh, answer is that can we use can we use a dielectric uh, sorry can we use can we uh, can we uh, uh, excite anapole state in a silicon nanosphere you know without relying on the design of structure and if we can detect this in a nanosphere nanospheres are much easier to make then we can make uh, use of this for various applications. And so what the way we did was we, we took our approach is called a beam engineering. So actually, well, I, I just uh, look at the time. We don't have, we have like seven minutes. So I'll try to go through a little bit faster. If you have questions, we can, I can answer that later, okay? 
So, so our approach is uh, beam engineering. By beam engineering, what I mean is that you know when you think about light, so light has a linear or circularly polarized polarization of light, you know, and yes, they yes, have yes. Switch. Sorry, yeah. Did, okay, no, okay. Uh, so, so light has, uh, usually we think about light with linear or circular polarization and they have a specially homogeneous state of polarization. Okay, but on the other hand, there could be some other type of beam is called cylindrical vector beams, you know, where you can have your uh, optical beam in a cylindrical shape and the, the state of the polarization can rotate, you know, azimuthally in space or radially in space, you know. And they are called vector beams. And if you illuminate your metal, uh, your dielectric nanospheres with, with those structures, you can selectively excite magnetic modes using azimuthally polarized beam. And you can also selectively excite radial uh, electric be, uh, polarization using radially polarized beams. You know. So in other words, in principle, if you if we if we illuminate a dielectric nanosphere within using a radially polarized light you know we should be able to create uh, excite the electric dipoles and the and the toroidal dipole within the structure so that's what the calculation we did and we found that you know in, in a dielectric nanostructure if you illuminate them with radial beam then actually you can uh, excite uh, a toroidal dipole within the structure and after we did the calculation, then we did some experimental measurement at the single nanoparticle level. So this is the optical spectra of single dielectric nanosphere of diameter 160 nanometer. And for, for azimuthal radial and linear polarized light, now as you can see that for about 500 nanometer for radially polarized beam, uh, beam illumination, the the scattering spectra shows a pronounced minima here, you know, and the, the scattering minima is about 10 times weaker than for, uh, for radial beam compared to the linear beam, you know. And then we did some uh, calculation and showed that at 500 nanometer, the amplitude of the electric and the toroidal dipole, they are actually equal to each other. You know, here, as you can see, they are equal to each other. They're crossing at this point. And also, they are 180 degree out of edge. You know, from this we concluded that we have uh, we have uh, like uh, excited anapole state within the structure. And also, we did some calculation. We we found that you know one can uh, one can actually localize energy with six times uh, with energy six times greater than for radial beam compared to linear beam illumination in this kind of uh, uh, scheme. And so this actually paper was published in, in physical review letters actually about uh, in January. So if you want to look at more uh, about this paper, actually you can refer to this one. So we have about three minutes left. So actually if you're wondering, you know, like why we, are, uh, uh, we want to excite anapole structure, anapole state. So there have been some report about, uh, you know, anapole nano laser, and one can have very high Q factor with uh, excitation of anapole modes. And also, like one can have broadband absorption and so on. So actually, I'll finish my presentation over there just by, actually I, had, uh, I wanted to show you some of the uh, lab, like what uh, that we did in our lab, um, our student working and all so on, but I think we don't have time for that. And so actually one thing is that we, our work, one of the, uh, another work was came at the, at the uh, cover of the Journal of Applied Physics. You know, this is also, uh, you might want to look at this reference if you want to know more about this work, uh, which is on selective excitation and enhancement of multipolar resonances in dielectric nanospheres using cylindrical beams. Yeah, and you know, like, uh, uh, this, is, this is the student that I'm currently working with. And I also, uh, I, I have a funding from the National Science Foundation in, 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 the, uh, in the US, and I would like to thank uh, uh, like uh, for their uh, support uh, to do this research. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll finish up there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Manna, for the nice and yeah. illuminative speech. Uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, basically, at Bizan Chandra College, we are also working on uh, nanoplasmonics. That's uh, oh. 
that's why this talk is very interesting for our group also. Actually, we, we are working on um, metal plasmonic nanoparticle and or basically colloidal metal nanoparticle for surface and Raman scattering based biomolecular sensor. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, very nice talk. Now the session is uh, open for discussion. So I would like to request, uh, I would like to hand over the charge of this session to our joint convener, Dr. Abdul Khaled. Uh, over to you, Dr. Khaled. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Manna, for such a good lecture. Now thank we you. can proceed to the uh, question and session. Yeah. We have got some questions uh, for this feature in the chat box. So now first question is from Somindra Mohan Vishas from Department of History, Dhiran Chandra College. I think this question is from Astrophysics. So can you explain how the wavelengths can determine the existence of galaxies or distant stars, as in the ratio bar, which state recently in headlines, in determining the existence of other intelligent beings. Actually, I don't know. I have no idea. I think this I'm sorry. I, I have no idea. I think that is so, not in my area of expertise. So I, I, I think I, yes, I'm, yes, I'm not yes. the best person to answer this question. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay, now next question is from Dr. Prabhupada Kumar Panda. He is asking, does all dielectric nanostructure material for sustainable plasmonic vibration? Yeah, actually that's a very good question. So one thing you need to consider is the refractive index of the material. So, I mean, if you think about the refractive index, so basically, I mean, physically, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like when you compared to air, you know, when the speed of light slows down inside the material, you know, that's what basically refractive index gives you, right? And so, so you need to consider like high refractive index, like silicon, germanium, and actually I can send you a paper where actually uh, they did calculation of various uh, plasmonic mode as a function of refractive index of the different material. But, but uh, you know, top of my head, I think I can think of silicon, germanium, and platinum. I think platinum is, oh no, platinum is not, it's a metal, I think. Platinum is metal, I don't know. So, yeah, it's metal. So yeah, I don't, novel metal. It's a metal, right, yeah, okay, so it's a metal. So yeah, so you have silicon and germanium for sure, but other ones, actually, I, I don't remember the top of my head, but I, I can send you a paper where actually they have done calculation of various plasmonic modes as a function of refractive index. So, so what you need to do is high refractive index because, you know, uh, like the magnetic modes that we want to use in this structure, so they only appear for high magnetic uh, resonance. You know? And so this, the diagram that I was showing you here, you know, so this uh, this shows the um, how um, the the resonance efficiency scales with the refractive index. You know, uh, what is that? Um, this one here, you see here. No. So your permittivity, uh, so your refractive index is square root of the permittivity, you know. And so this is how the how the the, the, the scattering efficiency scales with your your refractive index, you know. So and so so if you if you if you have uh, like a smaller index and then 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 you have like a smaller scattering efficiency, basically. Is this somehow related to dielectric constant, a real or imaginary part of the dielectric constant? In case of metal nanoparticles, we can see that if the imaginary yeah. part of the dielectric constant is higher, then the loss of the material is higher. That's why that right. So, the selection so, of so the in material. metal, in metal, it's uh, it's like negative, right? The imaginary yeah, part yeah, of the right. dielectric constant. But in dielectrics, it, it's almost zero. So that's why we can minimize the loss. Okay. So the imaginary part of the dielectric constant for dielectric is like very, very small fraction. It's, it's not negative, it's like positive number, but it's very, very small. Okay. Now, Dr. Panda is also asking, does plasmonic behavior of dielectric material similar to metal plasmonic nanoparticles accept the loss? 
Yeah, no, actually, I did, as did I mention during the uh, presentation. So basically, I mean, you know, like, uh, so, 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 like, in a, when we talk about localized surface plasma resonance, we have like a lot of free electrons, but for a dielectric, you have, uh, you know, you have these uh, electrons which are bound to the nucleus, you know. And so, so, and, and so, like, so the in surface enhancement of the electric field is basically comes from the bound electrons uh, within the nucleus, you know. And so, so the hope is that that we will have enough electrons, you know. That is, if you have high index, then you have you have enough electrons which can actually help you sustain some of the optical phenomena that we, we observe in plasmonic nanostructures. You know? And at the same time, we can minimize the loss because of uh, 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 like the, the because of the like as you as we said that the the imaginary part of the dielectric constant will be very small. Okay. Now Onuma Mahit is asking, can we overcome magnetic field with nano air structure or electrical 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 structure? Actually, I don't understand what uh, he meant by overcome magnetic field. I mean, why do you want to overcome the magnetic field in a nano air structure? Yeah. Onupam, can you can you please clarify Onupam. your question? Onupam. Yeah. Onupam, can you clarify your question? Like, what do you mean by overcoming magnetic field? Okay, I don't know. If, uh, I think he meant uh, the storage of uh, magnetic energy within the uh, diffraction oh. limit. I think. Oh, I see. I see. So, so no, actually, you cannot because I just described you uh, like the the mode of a cavity in a sphere. So, if you take an anoware structure, you know. So, actually, I I, I uh, I'm just trying to think of it. So you have like multiple modes. So you have, you can think of, a, of the nano wire as a multiple cavity. Okay, so you have like a multiple cavity and it will have multiple modes associated with it. And for each of the modes, you still will have the, uh, like, like uh, you'll have issues with uh, conservation of energy, you know? And also for nano wires, I think uh, you, you end up getting something like a, uh, of like surface plasma polaritons, you know, SPP, which propagates on the surface, you know, but they still actually, uh, so, so yeah, so no. Okay, uh, now, uh, from Shomdramon research, again, uh, what kind of technology is used in so sending universe when it escapes escapes the magnetic field of the planet. Yeah, actually, again, from, I, I, sorry, yeah, I, I think this I is out of the, I, I don't know, actually. Hey, yeah. uh, Shobhan. Okay. Shobhan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. May, may I ask questions? Yes, sure. You can directly Ajay, ask to the speaker. Manna, thank you for your, your talk. I also attended the last talk. Yeah, yes. actually, I, I can see that. Yeah, thank you for coming again. <laughs> <laughs> I can the Lord, but one thing is not clear to me that compared to the surface plasmonics, how you are having confining energy. You told that within the dielectric, today I understood in comparison to your lecture, your earlier lecture, that the magnetic modes in in anapoles are not that much dominant, whereas the electric modes are dominant, right? But the in dielectric there is no free electron. So how you are booming kinetic energy. In the last lecture, you told that a lot of electric energy and the free electron kinetic energy are so the please explain the energy conservation. Since ultimately you are producing a nano laser, how you are managing the energy conservation here at the cost of uh, magnetic part? Um, that uh, just uh, and uh, as an undergraduate student, you please explain it to me. Yeah. So okay. So there are two things. One is. Wait a second. So, so, so your question is like, say, for a, uh, for a, but in a dielectric structure, there is no free electron. Now, right. when I am within a diffraction limit, we are putting some uh, anapods sure. or discs. Yes. Then, how I am sure. getting boom in energy? 
What is sure. So, so yes. So for a dielectric, so the free electrons are not there, but so that conservation is provided by the bound electrons in a dielectric. And because of that, we have the the loss is 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 much low, lower, you know. So that's why we need a high refractive index so that we have high density of electrons, you know, which can actually uh, like provide a pathway for conservation of the energy. So for dielectric, that is done by the bound electrons. And, but again, we, if we have very low density of the electrons, so we will not have that scenario. You know? That's why we need to have a high index where you, you can have this uh, high density of electrons, which essentially does the same thing in terms of physics of a metal nanostructure. And at the same time, we can take advantage of these bound electrons because of their bound. So the loss, like the, the you know, like the collision relaxation time is, 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 is greater. And that gives us a low loss rate, you know. But we have to read. Can you please give me a very a reference line from American oh. Journal of Physics, sorry, so that these things can be understood? So uh, actually, if you look at this paper, so this is a review paper on science, you know. Science, so the volume is 354 and 6314, you know, and this is in 2016, this paper came up. So this is a review paper on dielectric nanostructures, resonant dielectric nanostructures. So, and you will get all the, like, not only about the basics of dielectrics, but also like all the related articles which has come up, like, since 2000, up to 2016, you know. So you find uh, uh, all the like physics behind it in in that paper actually. Okay. And actually, I don't know. I can send the I, I can send the Sovon the the, the please, the, please, please uh, send to Dr. Panda. Yeah, I'll, I can send it to Sovon and he can send it to you. Okay, you know? thank you. Yeah. Okay. The next next question is from Dioti Manan. He is asking: Is there any electric uh, dielectric material that is refractive index? that its refractive index can be tuned using DC voltage. Yeah, so, so now one thing you should imagine here that we are talking about uh, these structures being like in on the nanoscale, you know, and like say, in a nanometer dimension, like 100 nanometer, you know, how do you apply a DC volt by using a probe in that dimension at the single nanoparticle level? So, so in the current configuration, I mean, I don't think, in our configuration, I don't think that's possible. But in general, if you have a bulk dielectric material, you know, and if you apply some DC voltage to it, I don't know if it can tune the refractive index of the material. You know, I, I don't know. Uttam C is our student, uh, third year. Uh, oh, I see. So yeah, so if you have, if you have a bulk dielectric and if you apply some DC voltage and can you tune the refractive index, actually you can just do it quick Google search and find out if anyone has studied or this is a well-known fact or not. I don't know, actually. Okay. Uh, she is also asking, uh, can dielectric nanoparticles be used in rapid detection or treatment approach of COVID-19? <laughs> yeah, then I, I think I'll be a millionaire by now. I don't have to give talks anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. One thing okay. I can add, uh, there are uh, yeah, lots of research is going time. on. Uh, just, hello, yeah. just, just a second. Uh, I have seen some papers on SARS-based yeah. sensor. Yeah. They are uh, working on detection of COVID, uh, not COVID-19, that type of virus. And virus. Actually, so, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. by SARS technique, we can detect up to the molecular level. So single virus yeah, can be detected. It has yeah, very actually. high resolution. Right. So actually, if you look at this Stephen Meyer's paper, so this this paper, you know, like this, you know, Stephen Meyer at Imperial College, London. So his group actually was the first to uh, show uh, the surface enhanced Raman scattering in. Uh, no, uh, not that one. Wait a second. So uh, this paper actually. Yeah, so this one, this, this, uh, you see surface enhanced normal scattering using dielectric nano disk or nanostructures. This nature communication in 2015, you know, 
volume 6, 7, 9, 1, 5. So in this paper, actually, they did use uh, a, a dielectric nanostructure, an array of dielectric nanostructure to uh, like uh, enhance the Raman signal from, from molecules, you know, using dielectric. So yeah, I think if you go by, uh, like, if you talk about like in principle detection of um, like biomolecules or something or viruses using dielectric nanostructures, I think it's possible in principle. With relations to COVID-19, I think, I don't know. Okay, uh, now last question, I have a question. So uh -huh. uh, you say if the size of the particle is bigger, you can yeah. get electric water flow, but for nanostructure uh, directly, we can have both electric and magnetic water flow. So yeah. uh, is there any threshold value uh, below which we can if both uh, uh, dialect, uh, both electric and magnetic quadruple. Yeah, so actually, um, yeah, yeah. about 200 nanometer diameter, you can actually get both. Uh, so you see here, actually about one, so in, in this figure, you see this magnetic dipole, electric quadruple, and then magnetic quadruple, and so the other peak is actually electric quadruple. You know? Okay. So, so in about 180 nanometer within the like visible frequencies, you can actually get both the electric and magnetic. Both particles. the quadruple. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, you know, these are very difficult to interpret uh, spectra. So you need to do like some simulation and and do like some like uh, like multiple decomposition of the optical spectra, and then you can possibly detect this. There is no uh, sharp uh, transition point, I think. Uh, like in, 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 you mean in terms of diameter, right? No, right. In terms of diameter, no. Yes, yes. Wavelength. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, I guess, uh, yeah. Like at about 180 nanometer, you start getting uh, the electric quadruples as well. You know. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, now it's time for vote of thanks. So yeah. I request uh, Dr. S.K. Panda to give a vote of thanks. So, sir, it's over to you. Uh, thank Panda. you, Dr. Kalek. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank our today's speaker, Dr. Manna, for being with us today and share his uh, ideas with us. We sincerely thank our Vice Principal, Dr. Ramesh Kaur, for giving the opportunity to us to organize the webinar. That is always active and positive in all the academic related activities in the college. I express my deep sense of gratitude to the pre president of governing body of the college and all the members of the governing body for their encouragement and logistic support. Special thanks to the coordinator of IQSC, Dr. Sadhunath Kundu of the college, for his constant encouragement in organizing the seminars and webinars in the college. I would like to thank and acknowledge the technical support that I have received in organizing and conducting the webinar from our joint convener, Dr. Abdul Khale, and our uh, assistant professor, Mr. Unmesh Mondal of Department of uh, Computer Science of the college. Finally, I thank all the audience for your patience and cooperation. Thank you all. And that's the okay. end of today's okay. webinar. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you very thank much. You. Actually, uh, I found the students to be very active and engaging. You know? yeah. and so thank you so much. And I think you guys uh, keep doing the good work. Okay, yeah. thank, you, thank you, Dr. Manda, again. Yeah, yeah bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so this is the end of this presentation.